Hello, I'm John Chivaco, the co-chair of the NIGEO 2023 conference and a board member of the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. I'd like to welcome you to this recording of a live presentation from the conference, a two-day event which was held in Albany, New York on April 26th and 27th of 2023. This year's educational sessions and keynotes represent the latest in ground source heat pump system design, product innovations, and installation practices, along with important policy, regulatory, financing, and incentive updates. This presentation is one of over 40 sessions from the two-day event, all of which were recorded and available at NIGEO's website, www.ny-geo.org, along with session descriptions and a link to download the slides from each of the sessions presented. NIGEO is proud to make this content available to our members and other industry stakeholders. And if you are a member, thanks so much for your support and participation. If you find this content valuable and for some odd reason, you are not yet a member, consider joining NIGEO at the appropriate membership level with details available at our website. The live recording from the NIGEO 2023 conference will start in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening. Good evening, or good afternoon, or whatever. Uh, welcome to your next exciting forum of K-12. And by the way, I should say that um, I find that this is probably the most important demographic for this, for this technology, since we're always talking about uh, buildings and things like that, but we forget about where the leaders of this nation are being trained or taking classes. So when we put this into a K-12 school, we're actually building the, the marketing for this technology. Because every, every person, every kid in that classroom becomes a salesman for this technology. We just, I just did a, uh, not just two years ago, did a, uh, a um, K-12 school that was built in 1957 in Long Island. Valley Stream. And every one of those kids, this is in a disadvantaged uh, neighborhood. And every one of those kids really benefit from that being. Could you put a little bit further from the mic? It's really loud. Oh, I'm usually really loud, but. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first time I was ever told I was loud, but that's okay. Um, the, the fact is that every one of these kids uh, learned about, learns about geothermal technology. And um, now, remember I told you in a, it's in a disadvantaged neighborhood. I probably get five calls a month wanting to know how they can put it in their house. So it does a couple things. Everybody's kids go to school, whether it's a disadvantaged neighborhood, whether it's the leader of the industry, whether he's a millionaire, whatever. He's got, they've got somebody in school. So if we, can, if we can teach our kids that this technology is where they should be, then that's, that's exactly where we should be. If you come back later, there's a, I think there's one right after this, I'm gonna be talking about uh, using a school as, a, a, as an anchor uh, tenant for a ground loop. So we use the school building, usually they have soccer fields, baseball fields, whatever, parking lots, we use that as the anchor tenant. Here's the concept. And then we branch out, as you've all heard of network geothermal, we branch out to the neighborhoods around it, to the neighbors around it. And we allow those neighbors to buy geothermal equipment and put it on their bill, on bill financing for the utility company. Utility owns the ground loop. And also, the, the, this is for my heart, OK? And it's from unknown. What do you know? Does anybody know that person? <laughs> Jesus. Okay, I guess I'm going to live. Um, we allow we allow the school. The school has ESSER funds, by the way. ESSER funds have been uh, they've been uh, doled out in 2022 to the tune of 1.9 billion dollars for K to 12 schools. So that's a way that we can do it. It's a way that we can build this technology and, and get more and more people knowing what we are. Increasing awareness is the big thing. So with that, I'm going to 
uh, introduce, uh, I think, Jacob's up first, Jacob Goldman from Energy Sa Tax Service, right, Jacob? That is correct. Are you going to come over here? I'm going to go down there. You're going to, here, here you go. <laughs> okay, here we go. No, I didn't have any more coffee since this morning, so I brought it down a little bit. Um, how many people uh, here represent actual, uh, like building, the actual building, K through 12 or municipal, um, or are most of you vendors that sell into K through 12? Vendors? Education. Edu education? Okay. education, like trying to get people to register. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so. I guess the first thing, you've probably seen this slide maybe twice, some other people have similar slides. You know, I'm talking about the IRA here. Everybody's been talking about the IRA for the whole conference. So what I'll tell you about direct pay, K through 12 schools and municipalities will get a direct payment for their tax credits. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, how does that work? Uh, are they definitely gonna get it? Um, I'm here to tell you that this is real, a law was passed, the law is section 6417, and it allows state and political subdivisions thereof to get this direct payment. So it is real. Um, so you will be getting the, the, the payment. How you get the payment is the part that's somewhat up in the air. Uh, we believe that similar to most of the tax code, you file your taxes the year after you did something. So you, you, you worked at a job all 2022, and this spring you probably filed for your taxes in 2023. So more than likely what's going to happen is you're gonna do your project in 2023, and you will file for this direct payment in 2024. Now I say that more than likely, it is quite possible in the next month, because uh, down at the bottom here, remember this name, Lily Batchelder, she's the Treasury Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy, and she listed out the things that she, th that IRS is gonna be releasing. And two of the five items she listed have already come out, and they were separated by about two to three weeks. So we are about two to three weeks since the last um, release. That release um, was for energy community bonus. The two to three weeks later, we think we're gonna get domestic content bonus, we're gonna get rules for that imminently. And then two to three weeks after that, we're gonna get the direct pay. So we're gonna get information about direct pay and it's because of the words from Lily Batchelder um, that we kind of know that. And so far she's been to her word. Every two to three weeks, um, guidance has come out twice. We're expecting the third item to come any minute. And then the fourth is this direct pay one. So it is real and we're gonna find out the rules in three weeks, four weeks from now, we'll, we'll find out the rules. We've been talking about ground source the whole time here, but the ITC, the investment tax credit, K through 12 schools can get, and, and municipalities can get a tax credit not only for ground source, they, they can get it for every single one of these technologies. And it's basically the same credit. It starts at 6%, uh, if you get the five-time bonus, it goes up to 30%. Domestic content bonus gives you another 10. Energy community, another 10. Uh, anybody here interested in solar or wind? Okay, solar and wind, they have another way. They can get all the way up to 70%. Not available for ground source, but for solar and wind, there's a way to get all the way up to 70%. So there are other technologies that uh, K through 12 and municipal buildings can take advantage of to get these same exact investment tax credits. So let's talk about all these bonuses. I, I, I always feel like I'm in an infomercial when I talk about these. I'm like, first there's 6%, but if you order right now, you can get the five-time bonus. Um, so here we go, the five-time bonus. There, you know, people have already talked about it at the conference, but it's an or. There's three different ways to get the five-time bonus. Uh, you could be a small project, one megawatt. You, you notice I have that 284, 285 tons in, with a question mark because uh, Dan talked about it earlier. Maybe we're gonna be able to get that all the way up to 445. We hope so, um, but there's a little bit of a question mark there right now. If you're not a small project, you, you could get the five-time bonus by finishing by January 29th. 
the January 29th, uh, starting, sorry, starting before January 29th. Anybody have a project that started before January 29th? I have a school district project. They did a solar project. They did an interconnection agreement with the utility on January 15th. They're getting a $600,000 tax credit. They didn't justify the project off of IRA, nothing like that. They're getting $600,000. They, they placed their project in service in 2023, and they're, they're getting a 30% credit for it. Um, tremendous possibilities for your projects that already started because you're grandfathered in um, if you started before January 29th. The last, and I talked about it in the other presentation, prevailing wage and apprenticeship. It is an and, I'll just point that out, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. There's two requirements. Lots of people are saying, oh, I know all about prevailing wage, this is gonna be easy. It's the and, anecdotally we're hearing people are having some issues with. Because the apprenticeship requirements from the federal law is not exactly the apprenticeship requirements of each of the states people work in. Um, so you gotta make sure that you're meeting those apprenticeship requirements um, if you have a big project, if your project is bigger than one megawatt. So we got you the blender. Now we're gonna throw in the Ginsu knives. The Ginsu knives here is the domestic content bonus. Um, we talked about this as well. This is the guidance that's coming out imminently. I've been checking my emails all day to see if by chance we might get it today. That way I could give you all sorts of fresh information. Unfortunately, it didn't come out today. Um, but it's coming out imminently. Could be next week, you know, it's coming soon. And 100% of the cost of steel and iron, 40% of the manufactured product. Um, once again, tea leaves say one to two weeks from, from Lily Batchelder. Then we have the energy community bonus, okay? We got you the Ginsu knives, we got the blender. Um, we're gonna throw in two sets of Ginsu knives here and that's the energy community bonus. Uh, we got the census tract coal mine and coal fired and th then we have this weird one, 0.17% of direct employment. Um, there is that website. Uh, if you could just write this down, everybody just write down this, this web address. Um, that is the web address. Uh, if you want to copy these slides, my email address is just on the bottom here, so I'd be glad to send you a copy of the slide so you could get the web address. But that's the map. What I'm telling you on that map is don't trust the blue, okay? Anything that's blue, do not use the blue to justify your project because the blue is only the 0.17% employment from coal, oil, natural gas. It doesn't include the, the higher than average unemployment yet. In May, from May to May, they're gonna include that, time, uh, that uh, higher than average unemployment. Um, we talked about these things, other, I didn't personally, but uh, Dan talked about it a little earlier. You know, what typically qualifies the bore field and the heat pumps? And then downstream, we're using a tax interpretation, okay? It is a tax interpretation. It's based off of section 1.489C10IV. Um, everybody have that memorized? I'm gonna test later. Um, that tax interpretation is on a similar technology. It's not on the same, it's not on ground source. It's on a similar technology. And that allows dual use property that uses 75% of its energy from the ground to be included in credit eligible expenses. Prevailing wage, you saw this slide earlier. If you, How many were in my earlier presentation? Okay, so some of you didn't see my slide earlier. That's okay. Um, you do need prevailing wage for those big projects, and K through 12 and municipal buildings could be over the one megawatt. Uh, where do you find your prevailing wage? At this website, www.sam.gov. If they don't list the prevailing wage for your particular trade, you have to send an email to IRA prevailing wage at departmentoflabor.gov and it has to have all this information here. And then you need to keep records. You need to be able to prove that you met the prevailing wage and prove that you met the apprentice requirement. Certified payroll, anybody heard of certified payroll? Um, certified payroll is uh, likely to be able to prove your prevailing wage, but I think you have to collect some additional information to prove that you meet the apprenticeship requirement. Um, and what's that additional information? It's all about how much time apprentices worked. So you need to be able to prove out that apprentices were 12 and a half percent of total labor for 2023 and 15% of total labor starting in 2024. And the hardest one is you have to meet the apprentice to journey worker ratio on a daily basis, on a daily basis. Every day on the site, there has, you have to meet that apprenticeship to journey worker ratio. Um, and where do you get the apprentice to journey worker ratio? Anybody know? You get it from the registered apprenticeship program. 
So you have to make sure you get your apprentices from a registered apprenticeship program, and they will give you what your apprentice to journey worker ratio is. Now, if you go to a registered apprenticeship program and they cannot provide you with an apprentice, you have to have made a good faith effort you need to make a good faith effort to get apprentices. Now, what's the missing information on that good faith effort? Do you only have to do the effort before the project starts? Do you have to do it annually? Do you have to do it monthly? Do you have to do it daily? How often do you have to talk to the registered apprenticeship program to meet the good faith? They haven't defined that yet. And that's the last of the five items that Lily Batchelder uh, said that they're gonna give more guidance on. And hopefully in that guidance, it will tell us how to meet that good faith effort. That's all I got. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, I think he uh, is Jason. Okay, Jason Stark from, uh, I'm sorry. Jason Filler. Jason Filler from Stark Technologies is up next. Let's give uh, Jason your undivided attention. I don't believe you have any slides, right? So you have no. to be really interesting. <laughs> I'll do my best. All right, well, that was a really good presentation for Jacob. Uh, I don't know if I'll be as uh, interested as uh, his presentation, but I'll do my best. Um, so I come from the equipment rep world. I'm gonna talk about some of the incentives, nicer incentives that we use to help uh, get some of our projects to the end, end zone here. So the NYSERDA Clean Heat Program, I don't know if any of you have used that program, but we've used it several times to help progress our heat pump projects with K through 12 schools. Um, right now, the new clean heat program rules came out, I believe, in September, and we're receiving about $1,200 a ton for rebate money for, the, for new heat pumps. And we're finding that $1,200 a ton will, pay, will p help pay for new geothermal well fields. So the well field can be one of the most expensive parts of the project, and having that rebate really helps offset that cost. And some of the success we had with NYSERDA comes down to getting the pre-approvals with the project, because Sure, you guys have all ha been affected by the COVID delays, long lead times from the equipment. So we had lots of hopes of getting projects done last summer and due to various lead time issues, we couldn't get it done. And by the time the project was done, the program changed. But fortunately, we got the pre-approval from NYSERDA to proceed with the project. We locked in those rebates. So we had one project uh, at a K through 12 school uh, where they were replacing 250 water source heat pumps. And on this capital project for the school, that was one small part of it. They were expanding one building, they were adding um, a special needs area and a couple other um, different things, site work to the project. And when that, when the bids came in for that project, like everything in COVID, the budget was blown out of the water, there was tons of price increases, and the project was put on hold. And when these schools go out to bond for these projects, they go out to public vote, and the community votes for these projects, say it's, you know, they vote for $80 million for this project, that's all the money they get. And if the project's over budget and they want to, say it's $20 million, they need another $20 million, they need to put that back out to vote. Um, but because we got this rebate on these 250 heat pumps, it was about a $1.3 million rebate. They cut out the rest of the stuff in the project. You know, like I said, they had some site work, they had some expansions, but they kept the heat pumps in the project because they had that money locked in. So that really helped save this project, help the school be able to replace all the heat pumps, update their controls with this rebate. So it's really important to really get NYSERDA nice engaged early on, get their buy-in, because if you have that, if the project gets delayed a year, two years, you're locked in, I, know, I shouldn't say you're locked in that rebate, but you're locked into those set of requirements of the program, because the Clean Heat program has, let's say, evolved over time as things have come up. Uh, so engage and I started early on. Another project we had was for another local school district where, again, we're placing uh, some water-to-water -water units where over time they plugged up their heat exchangers with scale and mud and dirt, and they failed beyond their useful life. But we were able to work with NYSERDA and National Grid on this project to get the school rebate of $900,000. We had 13 water to water units that were placed. And the original capital project for, for this school did not include any heat pump replacements. It had, you know, replacing the pool unit, 
uh, upgrading the sound equipment, the auditorium, and unfortunately, uh, by the time this project was voted and approved upon, all the water, water heat pumps had failed and they had to do something. Uh, so with this rebate, they were able to tie these heat pumps into that project. So these, heat, these rebates, they're out there. The utilities, National Grid, NYSIC, whoever your local utility are, they're looking for commercial projects. You know, m most of the rebates that are being doled out are for residential, smaller scale projects. So they're looking for these commercial projects. If you bring them to the utilities, to National Grid, to, Na to NYSERDA, they will do their best to help you get as much money as possible to fund these projects. Um, so that's all I got for you. I apologize I don't have any slides. I hope uh, did okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's a rough average we use. Yeah, like if we're starting early conversations with school, they ask, what do you think about rebate? $1,200 a ton is a safe number to use. George, George, Hannah, you, you have slides. Are they, are they in here? I think they are, yeah. This is uh, Hannah Morgan. She's a rock star from NYSERDA, and she's a project manager for NYSERDA. Hannah? Thank you, Jeff. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me if I don't talk too closely? <laughs> awesome. I'm uh, Hannah Morgan. I'm from NYSERDA. And I'm super excited to be here today to talk about the programs we have for schools to help them decarbonize. Um, the program that I'm going to talk about specifically is the Clean Green Schools Initiative, um, which provides funding to schools to help them decarbonize their buildings. Awesome. So the, the program, it's a $59 million program. Um, we, we anticipate that we're going to receive additional funding from the Environmental Bond Act. But the goal of the program is to really help schools create healthier, more energy efficient environments. Um, the program is targeted for under-resourced schools in New York State. Um, so the schools that are either high needs or located in disadvantaged community are eligible to participate. Um, and in total, it's about 60% of public schools in New York State can participate in this program. No private schools. Yep, it's all public schools. It's a great question. Um, so we provide funding in two different tracks. Track one is open enrollment, which means you apply anytime you're accepted into the program. And we provide funding to help schools plan for and evaluate clean energy projects. So a lot of schools are coming into the program to evaluate clean heating and cooling systems. I would say actually 50% of the, of the projects come in are evaluating you know, ground source heat pump systems. Um, the second, the second track in our program is track two, and it's, we provide funding to do the construction of decarbonization program, projects. So the construction of you know, ground source heat pump, air source heat pump, and VRF systems. And it's competitive. Uh, we had our first round last July. Um, we're still in the process of contracting with those projects, but we're gonna do another round uh, within, we're, we're hoping within the next year. Um, and then the last thing that we provide through this program are, uh, is funding for clean energy educational activities, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the presentation. Um, so track one, again, we provide funding to help schools pay for engineers to do you know, technical work for the school district, whether it's benchmarking, you know, energy studies, clean heating and cooling design, hiring an energy manager, um, doing indoor air quality studies, because obviously you know, that's very important post-COVID. Um, we also pay for grant writing and fiscal advisors because we know some of the under-resourced schools in New York State might need a little extra support um, with, these, with these activities because they're stretched pretty thin. Um, and again, we pay for education activities, which I'll talk through a little bit more. So everything through track one, which again is you know, technical assistance, is 100% cost share, so there's no skin in the game from the school districts. Um, so if we do, you know, design, uh, if we pay for an engineering firm to do a design of a, of a ground source heat pump system, we would pay for that. Um, our cost share is dependent on the annual utility spend of the school district. So smaller school districts, um, the maximum amount of funding they could get through this program is about 450000 The larger school districts that spend more than 500000 annually could get up to 750000 um, so again, it's, you know, it's very lucrative for under-resourced school districts because, um, they, again, they don't have to pay for any of these technical assistance offerings. So now I'm going to go through you know, each one of these activities in a little bit more detail, um, you know, what we pay for under Track 1. The first thing is energy studies. So we'll, we'll, we'll pay for an engineering firm to, to come into a school district to evaluate energy efficiency, you know, clean energy, and clean heating and cooling opportunities. Um, which is super valuable, you know, when a school district is maybe potentially doing a capital up capital facilities plan, 
um, the, the engineering firm can really help them plan for um, energy efficiency projects in the future. Um, we also pay for, again, clean heating, cooling design projects. We have a, you know, a handful of projects within our program that we're paying for, um, you know, VRF design, we're paying for ground source heat pump design, um, and some air source heat pump projects. So we pay for it, we cover all those costs. Um, we, we pay for energy master planning and decarbonization roadmap. So if a school is very serious about getting off fossil fuels, um, we pay for the engineering costs of a, of, you know, a firm, you know, creating a roadmap of how the school can get off fossil fuels. Um, we also pay for clean transportation studies. Um, there's a mandate in New York State to try to um, electrify, electrify all the school buses. So again, we pay for the engineering firm to help schools plan for this, this, this uh, change, transition. Um, so they look at like what the new electric capacity would be, look at what type of new buses to buy, um, look at how the routes need to change. So we pay for that through this program. Um, we paid for indoor air quality studies. Um, what, the most, what I'm most excited about is we pay for energy managers for school districts through this program. Um, so we'll pay for a school district to hire a new staff person who will manage the day-to-day -day energy use. So whether it's you know, managing the building management system, getting kids excited about decarbonizing their buildings, um, planning for energy projects, doing building walkthroughs. Um, it's, it's a really great resource for a school district and immediately starts saving school districts uh, money. Um, how to participate in this program, super easy. We just require in track one is uh, an application, a scope of work, and a budget. Um, the scopes of work and budget are typically done, you know, submitted by the engineering firms. Um, we can pay either the school district or the engineering firm. So however best it works for the school district to have money flow, um, we, can, we can, you know, do both situations. Um, and there's resources on our website, you know, different templates that you can use when you're developing a scope of work. Um, the track two of the program, which is you know construction funding to do decarbonization projects, um, the first round did close, but the types of things that we supported were you know ground source heat pump, air source heat pump, and VRF, and then capital projects to move towards decarbonization for the school districts that couldn't really jump right to the ground source heat pump installation. So we'd pay for um, building electrification, transition to low carbon fuels, you know comprehensive deep energy retrofits. Um, the one thing we would not pay for is new fossil fuel-based systems. Um, we do, and again, we do anticipate we're going to um, have another round of this um, in the future. Um, and, the, and the last thing I was going to talk through is um, through, through this program, we have funding to get kids and teachers excited about clean energy and decarbonizing their schools. So we pay for a variety of activities, whether it's bringing them on field trips to you know, ground source heat pump sites, um, paying for internships, you know, sending them to conferences, paying for food, paying for lodging. Really, uh, we, we provide funding to schools to get them excited about these topics, and teachers can use money however, however they want um, to get kids excited. Um, and then the last slide is just, you know, if, if you're working with a school district that is not under-resourced, we also have the FlexTech program, which provides a 75% cost share to do energy studies and clean heating, cooling studies. Um, it's up to 500000 the only thing is, is that the school district must pay into the system's benefit charge. So this program, it, could, it can be private, it can be charter, it can be public. Um, the school just must pay into the system's benefit charge. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. George, you want to put this in? Because I'll, I'll have a stick. Okay, I wasn't going to present, but we have time, so I will. Uh, I was not going to present, but I think this is too important a, uh, a um, subject to not present. Uh, some of this stuff you may or may not have heard me say before. Can everybody hear me? Because I usually don't do this. Yeah. Can you hear me better this way? It's, 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 oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Damn, I've got all these rules. Um, so I don't usually read slides. So if you can't read the slide, I'll send them to you. Uh, once again, what this whole, this whole planet has changed for us since the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. So this is a big deal. The first, sent, the first uh, paragraphs, though, is the reason why you will hear me talk in the hallways or wherever about the fact that we should improve the school buildings prior to improving the electric bus. I live outside of Philadelphia. A, person, a kid is on a bus for 20 minutes, max. When that bus is parked, it's zero. 
That school's using it no matter who's in it, no matter what time of day it is. So we have to look at buildings first. There's some of the things you probably didn't know. K-12 schools are the largest public infrastructure, second largest public infrastructure investment in the U.S. and one of the biggest energy consumers in the public sector. They consume over eight billion annually in, en in energy, eight billion dollars. Here's something that I didn't know until recently. K-12 schools also consume about 8% of all energy used in commercial buildings, but as much emit as much carbon dioxide as 18 coal-powered plants. 18 coal-powered plants, now think about that. This is, by the way, this is what we, we're putting our future leaders of America in, okay? The average age of the school where we're staying right now in, in the U.S., it's 42 years old, where we're staying, where I live, and if you're on the East Coast, 49 years old. 49 years old. Remember, if you, keep, keep it in the back of your head, future leaders of America, okay? By the time a student graduates high school, they've spent 15,000 hours in, in a building. 15,000 hours. Second only to the time they spent in their house. Here's the opportunity for us. 138 public and private K-12 schools in the U.S. with 3.3 million school students and 30,000 private school students. New York, 731 school uh, public school districts with 4,856. I think that's a fairly good opportunity in case anyone wants to think about it. Every one of these schools need us. Private schools, 358,000 uh, students. Total is almost 3 million students, over 6,000 schools. Now I can tell you, I mentioned the one in, in Long Island, in Valley Stream. It was built in 1957, which means I could have gone to that school, elementary school. I'm 77 years old. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. Has things changed in schools since I was in school? I talk to, I talk to school district, school boards all the time, and I usually have some dope on the school board saying, well, I never had air conditioning. Well, I didn't either, because we had abacus. We didn't have, cons com uh. we, we didn't have computers, okay? What do you know? Things have changed. I normally, just for those of you selling school boards, I normally ask them, if you don't believe in technology, are you driving a 1960 car? Or do you have a black and white TV? Or are you not carrying a cell phone? So. There's all kind of things you can say to people to prove that they're stupid. <laughs> uh, some of you can't say what I say, okay? <laughs> so don't, don't do that. Here's, a, here's another big fact. GAO, the Government Accountability Office, 36,000 schools in the United States have failing HVAC systems. 36,000 schools. I'll bet you there's not that many SPCAs that have 36,000 that have failing HVAC systems. My point is, we care more about animals than we do about kids. Up until this point, we've always sold geothermal technology on you're gonna save energy. We're renewable. You're gonna save energy. The real f deal is, with these, two, with these two reports from Harvard and Yale, it says, that higher relative humidity impedes the transmission of respiratory viruses. Another name for COVID, I hate to say that word, but think about that. Now we're not only talking about energy, we're talking about health and safety, right? So people may not give a damn about health and about energy, but they may care about the fact that we're now talking about health and safety. And it's not only health and safety of the student, it's the health and safety of the entire building. In other words, students, staff, everybody involved. So that report says that heating only schools only have a relative humidity of about 10 to 20%. I now find out it's 10 to 15%. If we put a geothermal system in that school, we not only give them a controlled environment, meaning what, I'll ask you a question before we even start this. Maybe I have it on a slide. What's the biggest complaint in the school? Anybody tell me? 
Biggest complaint, just shout out, I'm not proud. Temperature. Pardon me? Temperature. I'm too hot, I'm too cold, exactly right. And for those of you that may have gone to school, in the morning, when the sun rises, that side is warm. And you'd say, we're too hot. And the janitor would, a building, oh, sorry, building engineer would go by and say, wave and say, this afternoon you're gonna be too cold because the west side is gonna to be too hot, okay? What we, this does, it gives everyone their own environment. That means if Mrs. Jones is too hot, she turns on the air conditioning. If Mr. Jones is too cold, he turns on heating. And guess what? The heating is coming from Mrs. Jones' room, right? So you all know that we're talking about two sets of loops in a school, one inside, one outside. So we go through the inside before we go to the outside. So, so we increase it if we put geothermal, ge, geothermal, I've only been in this 35 years, but my teeth are just brand new, I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> putting geothermal in increases the relative humidity to 40 to 55%, which is exactly what those two studies recommend. So here's my new concept. New concept. I want to use the schools as the anchor tenant. You've all heard about network geothermal. I've said 50,000 times here. The problem with, I'm an old utility guy. The problem with network geothermal is, okay, I can put it down this road, okay, and I ran a gas department for a utility company, and if you didn't have gas down your street, you had to give me 10 contracts of people who said they were gonna put gas in before I'd even run it. But let's go with the with Eric Eric and Nikki Bruno and Eric Boswell's uh, project in, in Massachusetts. You run this thing down and they paid for geothermal in both sides of the street. They bought them for them. Well, we all know that's a great pilot program. You can capture metrics, but there's no PSC in the world or PUC in the world gonna allow you to buy people equipment. So here's my concept. Don't put it down the middle of the street because now you gotta dig up the damn street and it puts, it puts everybody at, at risk. Let's use a school where they have a playground, a soccer field, a baseball field, a parking lot. That school becomes the anchor tenant. So when that school's in, the homes are normally not as occupied, right? And vice versa. In the summer, the school's out, the people are, the people are home. Here's the big thing. We don't remove the fossil system. We tie it into the loop, not into the school. So if we really have an extreme weather, we put a little bit of heat in the loop, right? Because nobody dies there too hot. They die from being cold, okay? But here's the thing, we can pay for that. And I talked to Rory last night, the chairman of the PSC, and I said, look, this is cool, I wanna do this, he likes the anchor tenant, but I need your help. <clears throat> because utilities have to give on-bill financing for the people that are gonna buy the geothermal equipment. So now they put on-bill financing, and I, because I've dealt with PUCs for 50 years, okay, I usually get some idiot that's a staffer saying, well, what about the people that don't buy geo? Well, here's, what, here's the answer. By putting it into those houses, you're reducing peak load by 0.55 kW per installed ton of capacity. You reduce emissions dramatically. You create jobs. There's all kinds of benefits for the people that didn't even get the, the geo. But I'm not saying that, you know, am I dying of a heart attack or did the air go off? I went off. Good yeah. Lord. It, it was, they were freezing me when I walked in here. Uh, my whole deal is the utility should own that loop. The utilities are our best friend. They should own that loop. That's what they do. They sell heating and cooling. And it's funny because I talk to gas companies, and I, like I said, I live in Philadelphia, so I'm talking to the municipal-owned gas company. And I said to the president of the gas company, what do you sell? And he said, gas. No, you don't. You sell heat, right? Gas companies sell heat. Does anybody just buy gas? If you be, you'd be dead. You know, I mean, you pay for gas. <laughs> But the thing is, when I say you should own the ground loop, 
Am I getting close? Or? No, no, I'm cool. I never touch that stuff. I've got coffee up there. Um, but but when, when you talk about a ground loop, now you're talking, and I said this to him, if you owned a ground loop, guess what? You could not only sell heating, but you could sell cooling. He said, that's electric. I'm thinking, how dumb are you? Does anybody have a gravity-fed gas furnace or boiler? Those of you, there's, there's a couple old guys up here know what the hell I'm talking about, right? It's illegal not to have an electric pilot on a gas appliance. So if the gas, if the electric goes out, guess what doesn't work? Yeah. Gas, right? So guess what? Hey, stupid, you're going to get cooling. And he looks at me like I've just talked, like, oh my God, cooling? What are we going to do with that? How about sell it? Right? These are all, you can't be as arrogant as I am sometimes, but you may want to talk to them about it because we're trying to give them a new way to do business. Gas, electric companies, water companies, they're all our friends. They just don't know it yet, okay? You heard Rory talk last night. By the way, that was the most incredible talk I've ever heard from a, legis from a regulator. Incredible. And when I mentioned this anchor tenant deal to him, he loved it. And when I said, you know what, you might have to give allow a utility to do on-bill financing. He said, why wouldn't we? I almost fell down. I mean, I, didn't, I was six foot tall when I first started working with regulators. <laughs> but this is where this goes. So look at all these catchwords. And I love utilities because they have all these synonyms and everything. How about, how about any, any DER? We're a distributed energy resource. We're also a non-wires, non-pipeline alternative. These are all their catchphrases. We fit in all of them. And we're renewable. And we delivered a ROI, a return on investment. Wow, God, we're really getting technical here, huh? <laughs> so, why does, this why does this work? First of all, it, uh, it takes that 49-year-old school and makes it better. And typically, especially for disadvantaged kids, it gives them a, play, a safe place. Remember, schools are no longer just a school in a lot of neighborhoods. They're safe places for kids. I happen to be the chairman of the board of a $25 million community action agency. We run five shelters, and we take people from total dependency to total self-sufficiency. And you know who's disadvantaged? Really? The kids that are being raised in those households. So the times that they're safe are in those schools. And maybe, just maybe, we can keep those schools open during the summer because now they're space conditioned, right? And God forbid we, we pay for that energy because they're only kids, what do they know, you know? So, it would also do one main thing, and I think I said this before. Am I, do I have time? Yeah. Am I good? Nine minutes. Oh, wow, I can say about 40,000 words in nine minutes. <laughs> uh, um, no question. No, no, I'm fine, I'm cool. <laughs> anyway, you just shout out. I'll ignore you, but just shout out. <laughs> the thing that we have, the problem we have with our industry is lack of awareness. Does everybody agree with that? I still have people going, well, how, well, how does that work? Is it new? It's 40-year-old technology. How dumb are we that we haven't figured this out yet? So why don't we educate the kids? When you educate a school, nobody goes home, they tell their parents about it. When I did that, when I'm, and I've done probably probably about 150 schools in my career, okay? But the main, main one was this last one in, in Valley Stream. I, well, I worked with, before we were putting it in, I had to meet with the school board, meet, meet with the superintendent, meet with the parent-teachers union, or group, right? And I got all these questions like, oh, what's it gonna do? Is it as good as our 1957 boiler? Uh. Somebody actually said that, I thought, damn. You think a 1957 boiler is good? What kind of car are you driving, you know? Uh. I, got, I got calls, I, get, I got calls after that congratulating me and one big, I got one complaint. I can no longer send my kid to school in a strapped t-shirt. Now, I went to private school and my kids went to private school so I would never in, my, in any, any event send my kid to school in a strapped t-shirt. But what they were saying was that you're usually too hot. So the kid had to come to school so he could deal with it. Now it's the same temperature year round, right? 
it's that same temperature. So they, and by the way, it's a one room school, so they can't open the windows because it's dangerous. They open the windows, purses disappear, you know, out the window. So this does a couple things, but mostly it gives the kid, kids a better learning environment. Let's face it, anybody work in an office building here? I, I asked that only at this conference. Are they conditioned? They have air conditioning? Yeah. Uh, believe it or not, I've talked to school boards that said, we don't want air conditioned schools, and I asked that same question. Of course, everybody raises their hand, and goes, yeah, I would, I would you go if it wasn't air? Nope, I wouldn't go. But it's okay, we send your kids there. You know, t typically it's people my age that are there, don't have kids anymore, that are making these decisions. If you've got young kids in school, fight for this. Fight for this. You already know how to get to us, you're here. Oh, I started to say, we create a whole sales force. Every, every room has 25 kids that become our salesmen for us, okay? Now, what we're responsible for, we better do a good job. Because I'm going to tell you, and somebody mentioned it today, what's going to happen, and it's happened before in my time in this thing, as this money comes in, everyone becomes an expert. And the price of magnetic signs on trucks goes up because he buys the sign, puts it on the truck, he's the expert. When it goes south two years later, he's out of business and you're going to get screwed for it, okay, if you're in our industry. So by all means, if you're in New York Geo, Hold people accountable. Put people out of business that shouldn't be in this business or get them training. I sound really radical, don't I? Okay. Uh, here's the other thing. There, should, there has to be a commitment by the entire ge geothermal industry to support and aggressively deploy this, this initiative throughout the United States. Schools are where we should be. It's nice we want to do these big buildings and one Java is great. I like the fact that it's one Java and they're telling me they got 30% affordable. Yeah, okay. What's affordable? I don't think Midtown is where the affordable people go. But hey, that's cool you want to say it. I, would, uh, I have this written down as a business plan for anybody who wants to see it. I'm sharing it with, with four utilities as soon as I leave this conference, which means that they heard last night that Rory Christensen was in favor of it, which all, always prompts utilities to do something. Right, Anna? Oh, yeah. When the regulator says, ah, that's a good idea, everybody gets it, you know? So that's my name, that's my email, that's my, that phone number is on 24 seven. Thanks very much. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Am I speaking too loud? But no, I'm okay. Like, yeah. Oh, you want the microphone? Okay. Who's got questions? If you don't have questions, that means I was the best speaker there. I had two questions. Yes. One of them, is anybody aware of a school that uses their hot water boiler as part of a geothermal loop? So that's one question. And then the other question is, on FlexTech, how do people get that 75% money before you pay it to them? In other words, how do they get financing? You're gonna give it to them after the project's done, I assume. Yeah, so they can invoice them I have one. I have one. Oh, oh sorry. I'll answer the FlexTech question. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. I'll do the FlexTech question. Um, so, so they can invoice every month. So like once, once we accept the application, we send a purchase order, and then they can invoice every month, and we pay them every month for the project. Your, your first question was about the uh, hot water? Give me that, what, you mean like to support the loop or? Yeah, you can do that, yes, absolutely. What I said to you was. No, not yet, no, nope. It, I've seen it done at a couple schools in, uh, around this area, we were, were heating dominant climate. So that boiler essentially creating a uh, hybrid geothermal system. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the boiler is going to inject heat into the loop to keep it above 32 degrees. And sometimes the school will keep that boiler or the geo loop at 50 degrees just to have better performance. Um, so it is a very common practice in any heat and dominant area, especially schools, because figure the kids are out of school um, in the summer. So they have unbalanced loads, you need that additional heat source 
for schools. You can also use that heat in the summer to charge your fields, certainly then the rest of the year. Well, no, because you're going to use it for cooling for the houses. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So, uh, my name is Dennis Collet. I'm from the uh, town of Red Hook. And, uh, you know, I'm actually, you know, had advocated for Pond 4157, I guess is what it was. It was not, we're not a needy school because we're actually a pretty affluent area on the Hudson River. Um, but I think the problems are all the same. So one of the problems that I've had is that the school board is, you know, short term, and most of these people are lay people that have no idea what we're even talking about. So if I say to them, geothermal, they look at me, uh, oh yeah, we get heat from the ground directly. Uh, you know, I don't know that we can drill that deep. And, you know, they, their vision is, uh, you know, I'm here for this, the student population. I'll vote for any budget that comes along as long as we think it's going to benefit the, the students. And um, one of the problems that we've had is that um, they make a decision, go out to bid for, like in, in our case, Tetra Tech, which is kind of a multinational uh, engineering firm, uh, comes back. They don't really, there's no transparency on the design. And when we've had conversations, we said, uh, well, what's the, you know, are you looking at renewable energy alternatives? And while there are different sections within these companies, these engineering firms, I, I, I'll get to a question. <laughs> but, but while there are, you know, there are different divisions within these large engineering firms, including some very, you know, advanced you know, thinkers, uh, engineers, they, uh, they probably assign, because our school is relatively small, my suspicion is that they've assigned somebody that's a newbie in Tetra Tech as an architect. They come along and they said, oh, we don't need to replace the boiler because the, even though it's a fossil fuel boiler. So now you look at their rationale and you're trying to find out what, you know, our, our problem is that there's no way to, you know, to uh, convince the school board that their advice about this boiler is, is bad advice. So we start looking at the budget, and, and here's an example. That boiler was put in in 2015. It's an asset that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, band, the bonding matures in 2030, okay? The recent proposal was to retain the boiler, do some fixing up of piping and other things for $15 million, and its bond expires in 2040. So we've compounded the, you know, the cost without any change in, in a system to be able to enable renewable energy. Is your question how do we do that? Well, it, it's a qu there's two parts. What I heard Hannah say, was, uh, was that there was this idea of a, uh, an energy manager. Because the, the school board is constantly rotating and it's new faces, and because the school itself is not really staffed with people who are you know, uh, aware of this, something like an energy manager, wouldn't that be a way of being able to enable this rather than having someone from the town just speak up and say, hey, look, we need to change, we need to change our perspective on here and time's running out, right? So, so anyway. What, what I, I'll tell you what, because I, I run into this all the time. Good. Are you a, are you a geothermal guy? Are you yeah, a, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 the I, I'm the energy chair for the town of Red Hook. Okay, so, here so we, we do this. They'll never listen to you because you're always talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like kids, I'm, I'm not being smart. You can say the same thing I say, and they're not gonna listen to you, they will listen to me. Because I always, go, I'm a nonprofit, okay? And I will go in and say, you know that boiler that they said they could, they shouldn't take out? It's because they don't know any better, okay? You don't wanna really piss them off because that's not fair. I can. Because what I tell, the, what I tell that school board, it's up to them to be creative. It's up to them to, to be the ones that says, 
we're going to do this. We can still keep the boiler. I'm not saying get rid of it. But as, as uh, Jason said, we put it, use it to, to, to support the loop. And I'll tell you what, I do, I get, I've had probably 95% success because you start people thinking that if you don't do this, you're doing a disservice. I know you're not getting paid, but you are responsible because you're on this board and being on a scoreboard is, school board is a pain in the ass, quite frankly. Am I right if you've ever done it? I have. So, I mean, that's the way you get that done. Give me, take my number down, give me a call, I'll be glad to help you with that. Anybody else? And by the way, I'm free. Well, not free, but I'm cheap. <laughs> How are we doing? Um, okay. Okay, okay, I get three, three quick answers. <laughs> All right, so, so, so Hannah, you mentioned about um, that 60% of schools, I think, are eligible for those, for those funds, and there's about $59 million how, I'm just curious, how much does that 59 million, like what percentage does 59 million actually fund electrification of that 60% of school districts? You, you, you know, like what's the total amount? Of money that's going to schools? Right, exactly, yeah. in the aggregate. Like how? Yes, yeah, so there's um, 35 million for track two and then 15 million for track one. Okay. So for like the technical assistance, it's 15 million and then there's 35 million due to the construction. But there is, um, we anticipate, you know, a large chunk is coming from the Environmental Bond Act to do more construction projects. But do you have a sense of like, I know there was like 59 appropriated for the purpose, but like what's the actual demand? Oh, the total, like the cost to actually electrify? Yeah. You know, I don't have that number on the top of my head, but it's, uh, I, I feel like it's probably pretty expensive. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and do you, do you have a sense of like the range of how much it costs to electrify a school? Yeah, so I, I would say, so what I've seen for like elementary to high school is like four to 10 million, I would okay. say to do the ground source heat pump system, would, would you agree? It, it, it'll depend on the size of the school. It's hard to yeah. say, yeah. And depending on what the, what the, what the strategy is, I mean. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.